New setup, huh? You guys cool with this? All right. I'm trying to make it a little casual here. Um, so some of you might know who this guy sitting next to me uh, is. I'm Ross Ramsey. I don't speak up here a lot. But at any rate, the guy to my right here is Kyle Pearson. And some of you might know who he is. Some of you have no idea who he is. Uh, Kyle and another guy by the name of Aaron Probanik uh, came alongside our church about a year ago to help equip us to reach our community with the gospel. And uh, it's been, to lack of a better word, a real ride. And uh, Kyle, uh, his family's actually planted here. He has a wife and two kids. I, I, they're probably in Sunday school right now. But Kyle works for a mission organization called East West, and uh, they're located here in Dallas. But Kyle's part of a larger initiative called No Place Left, which comes from the Bible. It's actually in Romans chapter 15, verse 23, where Paul says at the end of the book of Romans, he says, there's no place left for me to go in Asia where the gospel had not been heard or preached, which is a rather remarkable statement in light of the fact that there were seven to eight million people in Asia at that time and he did this in 15 years without the modern trappings of communication and all the things that we have. Well, Kyle, with a group of about, gosh, there's several people now, uh, are trying to say that about DFW, that there would be no place left in DFW where the gospel, people did not have an opportunity to hear the gospel and respond to it. And, um, and so we've come alongside him, or he's come alongside us, so we can say that about Alan that every person would have an opportunity to hear the gospel, which brings us to why we're here this morning. Chad started a series several weeks ago called This Is Us, and it's basically an attempt to answer two very important questions. Who are we as a church, which we should be asking ourselves all the time, and what is important to us as a church? Now, depending on who you ask, I imagine if you went to, down to the outlet mall and asked people, hey, what do you think the church should be doing? You get a million different answers. The beauty of this question is there's not a million different answers. We believe that our Lord Jesus Christ gave us a crystal clear pattern of what we are to be as a church. And that pattern actually begins to emerge as we examine his life. So what I want you to do is I want you to get your Bible out. This is going to be one of these good old-fashioned <laughs> Bibles out Turn to the book of Luke, so it goes Matthew, Mark, Luke, it's the third, bi uh, third book in the New Testament, and we're going to begin to try to draw out a pattern of our Lord Jesus Christ that I believe applies to us. So, Kyle, why don't you kick us off? What do you got? All right. <clears throat> uh, well, we want to start with Jesus, right? And so, uh, we are the, the church um, built on the confession that Jesus is the Messiah, that he is the head of the church. Uh, he's guiding the body. So we want to make sure that we look. Seems like a good place to start. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we want to we look to Jesus. And um, rather than ask the question, what would Jesus do? We want to ask the question, what did Jesus do? <laughs> and seek to follow his example. And uh, we see Jesus making this statement that as the Father sent me, so I send you. So we want to ask the question, well, how was Jesus sent? Mm -hmm. and, and Paul tells the Corinthian church, imitate me as I imitate Christ. Well, is there, uh, did Jesus do things in a way that could be imitated? And I, I, think, he, I think he did. And so we're going to look at Luke. The reason we're looking at Luke is because Luke is an orderly account of Jesus' ministry. In fact, Luke says that. He says, I want to do an orderly account, so it's the most chronological. Right. So we want to look at uh, Luke chapter 3 and ask the question, did Jesus have a pattern? So we're going to look at Luke 3, 21 through 23, and this is the start of Jesus' ministry. And Jesus' ministry, he, uh, the beginning, he's baptized, and the Holy Spirit comes upon him. And the Father says, this is my beloved Son with whom I'm well pleased. And he imitates, or he models for us, uh, what it means to be dependent on the Holy Spirit. And, you know, Jesus is God. He has a divine nature. He has a human nature. Um, and so, you know, you, you could think he could do things. Uh, he wouldn't need the Holy Spirit. He right? he's, need, pretty, he's, God, he's pretty right? confident. Yeah, uh, right. But he's modeling for us uh, what it means to be dependent on the Holy Spirit. Because when Jesus leaves, 
we're going to have to be dependent on the Holy Spirit right. to, to live and move and, and finish the work that he's set out, set out to do. So from the beginning, the Holy Spirit descends on him, and then he is led out uh, full of the Holy Spirit, it says in, in uh, Luke chapter 4, verse 1. The Spirit leads him from the Jordan. He's full of the Spirit. Then he's led by the Spirit into the, the desert uh, where he's tempted by Satan. And then he returns from the desert in the power of the Holy Spirit. And in Luke chapter 4, 18 through 30, Jesus enters into his hometown and he reveals the purpose for why he was. This is cool. So he goes back to his hometown. He goes back to where everybody knows him, his family and friends. And he goes back, literally like going back to your home church. And he goes and gets up in front of the synagogue. So what does he say? And so he reveals the purpose of his anointing. He opens the book uh, of Isaiah, uh, the scroll, um, and he says this, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor, proclaim freedom to the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, set free the oppressed, and proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. So to summarize that, Jesus is saying, The Spirit of the Lord has anointed me to do two things, to proclaim and to heal. So the, the picture is, is, again, Jesus reads this scroll in his home church, rolls it back up, sets it down, and sits down. It's almost <laughs> like he drops the mic. <laughs> what happens next? And so um, after that, I mean, there's a, there's, a, there's a disagreement because he's in his hometown, and people don't like what he's saying. They go and try to stone him. Yep, and so he leaves, and uh, the first thing that he does is he enters the synagogue, and he does two things. In chapter 4, verse 31. Yep. He proclaims and he heals a demon-possessed man. And so, you know, when we go out and we follow Jesus' pattern of, of taking the, the message of the kingdom into the community, uh, we want to do the same thing. We want to see God break into people's life as we pray for them and ask God to do a, the miraculous. And uh, an example of that was here one Wednesday night. Uh, this was probably back in the spring, I think. We have many stories like this, but this is one story that uh, I just remember very distinctly. That uh, we were on a, a Wednesday night here in ESL, and uh, I was talking to a lady from Libya, and uh, I just simply asked her, "Hey, how's how's something, or what's something I can pray for you about? How can I pray for you?" And she said, "Well, my son needs a job." Well, he was going to get. He was losing his, his visa. That's right. That's next, right. And he needed a job by next morning by 9 a.m. If you're not, he's being sent back. That's right. Home. Yeah. Important right. detail. So this was yeah. a time-sensitive <laughs> prayer. It's important request. detail. I remember that. And uh, so I just very simply, Lord, provide this young man a job in Jesus' name. So we moved on. Next week I came back. Wednesday, this woman came up weeping, crying. And she said, God gave my son two jobs. By so nine in the morning. By nine, morning. that yeah. next, you know, just God answered that prayer. So it was a bold prayer. When when you do things like that, and God's and God breaks into people's lives, whether it be through healing, whether it be through provision, whatever it may be, um, <laughs> their eyes are opened, and so uh, we want to follow this example, and we've seen this happen, and so. Um, as, as Jesus is, is healing this man, he, he's invited, or after he heals the man, he's invited into Simon Peter's home. And when he gets into Simon Peter's home, there's another healing that happens, and that's his mother-in-law. He, he heals his uh, mother-in-law, and, you know, word's getting out that Jesus is there, and he's performing miracles, and, you know, people are starting to yeah. come to the house. And Jesus breaks away, and he gets alone with the Father, and he prays. And then he comes back um, as the disciples are saying, hey, the whole town's here to see you, Jesus. And then he reveals uh, his intentions. And, and this is what he says. He says, I must proclaim the good news about the kingdom of God to the other towns because I was sent for this purpose. And so Jesus could have set up a mega ministry where he said, here I am, bring all the people to me and let me heal them and proclaim the kingdom. He could have done that, but he didn't. He said, no, we got to move on. And, you know, <clears throat> we see at the very beginning of Jesus' ministry uh, a, a real clear picture of, of, of the patterns that he's going to begin to do throughout the book of Luke. 
So a pattern and begins to emerge very early on with, by chapter 4. Very, very early. And so uh, these are some of the key things that we see Jesus doing here on the front end. And they're going to really begin to crystallize as we move forward. And this is in your bulletin. This is, this is where we're going to talk a little bit about the pattern, and then we're going to come back to it. So the answers, the answers to the test are right here. Uh, the first one is, is spirit dependency. We see Jesus modeling that, dependent on the Holy Spirit. And then, two, we see him finding God-prepared people who open up their spheres of influence. So we see that in Peter, um, and we'll see that very clearly going on. Uh, we see, number three, proclaiming the kingdom of God and dis- uh, demonstrating the power of the kingdom to heal. We see him gathering people. So we see that in Peter's home, and church history shows us that there was a church in Peter's home for 400 years. So this uh, more than likely was the beginning of that. And then we see him raising up leaders to continue the work. And so when he says, let us go to the other towns, he's bringing people along with him so that they can watch him as he's developing leaders. But we'll see that again more clearly. And then number six, he's moving on to unreached people in places. So in chapter 5, so we're in chapter 5, Luke chapter 5, verse 27 through 31. This is the, the scene where Jesus calls Levi. And we're talking about, you know, God-prepared people. And as we're going out into the community, we're, we are expecting that God is at work, that the Holy Spirit is doing what the Scripture says the Holy Spirit would do, and that's convict people of sin, righteousness, and judgment. And they're calling, uh, the Lord's preparing people's heart through life circumstances or however he's doing it. And so um, we see here in Levi that Levi was God-prepared. And that he opened up his sphere of influence. He had a party. He had a party. Yeah. He had all of his friends come over and, and invited Jesus into his house. And he began to, you know, proclaim the kingdom to those folks. Um, and we see God preparing people all the time. Some of you all have experienced this. Um, but there was an instance where we were out in the community. We were carrying through prayer, proclaiming the kingdom of God. And we knocked on this young man's door, and he peeked around the corner, you know, shirtless and just kind of looking at us like, who are you? And uh, we asked if we could pray for him, and uh, he said, pray for me. I said, hold on a second. So he shuts the door. We're like, okay. And he comes back. He's got a shirt on. <laughs> he says, come on in. So he came into his, into his apartment. He says, sit down. This is a young man. He's probably in his 20s. And he said, uh, who, who sent you guys here? And we said, well, no, I guess God, <laughs> but nobody in particular. He said, my parents didn't send you guys here. He said, no. <laughs> no. <laughs> that's uh, what parents do. Yeah. That's they, they they do. Can, you guys can't get, if I can't get to them, you can, someone else can. And so I always said, no, 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 they didn't. Uh, we just care for you. We want to pray for you. And he said, this is so weird. He said, two minutes ago, before you knocked on my door, I was contemplating on taking my life. And we prayed for him, and we got to share the gospel with him and baptized him and started discipling him. So, (laughs) you know, what what that story he just tells happens about once a month with us. Mm -hmm. In fact, it happened two weeks ago. A group went out on a Saturday. I'm sorry, this is in our notes. Um, They knocked on the door of a girl who was in the same situation, Mm -hmm. and uh, we got to intercede. Um, But these types of things are not uncommon when you start going. Mm-hmm. So it's true. Um, God prepared. And people. so we see, um, you know, Jesus finding person of peace right here in, in Levi. God prepared, opens up a sphere of influence to Jesus. And then jumping forward to Luke chapter 6, uh, 12 through 16, uh, Jesus is beginning to, to develop leaders, to pull in leaders, to identify these folks that are going to take this work uh, on from himself. So up to this point, Jesus has done really three things, proclaimed, healed, found persons of peace, and he's began to filter for leaders uh, so that he might send them out to proclaim and heal and find persons of peace. So um, look on the screen there. You see Mark 3, 13 through 16. I think that's yeah. um, It says this, And he appointed 12 whom he named apostles so that they might be with him, and he might send them out to preach and to have authority 
to cast out demons. Sound familiar? <laughs> it's exactly what Jesus had been doing. <laughs> so he's beginning to develop these folks and uh, send them out to do the exact same thing. Yeah, th- this has actually been one of the most rewarding aspects of this pattern in our church, that we've been doing this, is that when we started doing this pattern, and by the way, I didn't know this is what we were doing when we started this. It, it was just like, whoa. When we started this pattern, um, one of the most rewarding and surprising aspects of when you do this is the people God draws out of the body of Christ. It's people I would have passed over. It's not your usual suspects. So in the last year, we have, and this is a conservative number, somewhere between 30 to 40 people right now that at the drop of a hat, in fact, I could call them up right now, I'm looking at some of them, could share the gospel like that, could lead somebody to a profession of faith. They could walk them through that and not stop there. They could actually begin through the scriptures, begin to tell them the importance of baptism. And then it doesn't stop there. They can then begin to disciple this person. They don't have to go, hey, I'm going to take them back to my, uh, my group or take them back to Chad or Austin. No, they have the tools, the competency, and the confidence to begin discipling that person one-on-one for months. And there's several in that 30 or 40 who can begin gathering people around that person. They have the confidence and confidence. I would have never imagined that. And of those 30 or 40, there's another 15 or 20 that are coming behind them and that are bumping up against that competency. Um, it's been an absolute amazing thing. Now, why should we be surprised? Jesus says in Mark chapter 1, verse 16, and he also says it in Luke at the beginning of his ministry, he goes, you follow me, command. I will make fishers of men promise. And that's exactly what has happened. It's almost like Jesus is saying, you do it my way, and I will join your work. I will raise up the people, and I will equip them. And that's exactly, I am I'm living for the I'm living this verse and seeing it week in week out is uh, there is no amount of money that could pay me uh, to, to to not be have a front line fifty yard line seat for that the choosing of leaders next yeah it's powerful uh, so we're in Luke chapter eight now and uh, up to this point Jesus has done three primary activities. Proclaim. This sounds like a broken record. <laughs> Heal, <laughs> find persons of peace. And uh, Luke, who uh, authored Luke and Acts, he does this in both the books. He, he offers summary statements a lot of the times, pivoting the storyline. And the story's about to pivot here. And so in Luke 8, chapter uh, 1, or Luke verse 8, verse 1, um, we see one of these summary statements. So Luke's going to summarize what Jesus had been doing. So Jesus was traveling from town to town, proclaiming Proclaiming the good news of the kingdom. The 12 were with him, okay, so leadership development there, along with women who had been healed by him. Jesus did exactly (laughs) what he said he was going to do. And so um, Jesus is preparing these disciples to send them out. And uh, before he does that, he begins to set their expectations for what they're about to experience, yeah. what they're about to see. Yeah, this is where it gets interesting. So uh, at, in Luke chapter 8, verse 4, we, we come to a parable, okay? It's called the parable of the sower. So Jesus has been living this stuff out, and then he stops, and he begins to teach in parables, which is remarkable because up to this point, he hadn't taught in parables. This is, that in itself is enough. But he, he, he begins to teach, and he, he starts with this parable called the sower. Now, this parable has been teached from this pulpit many times. But this parable is massively important. In fact, in the, in the Gospel of Mark, this parable is given in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. In Mark, Jesus says something remarkable about this parable. He says to his disciples, if you don't get this parable... You won't get any of the other parables. And consider that statement in light of the fact that from this point forward, his main method of teaching was parables. So he says, you don't get this one, you don't get the rest of them. So, So it bears a lot of weight. You're like, man, what's going on here? 
Let me quickly give you a 30,000 foot flyover of the parable of the sower. Okay, I don't have time to jump into it. It's an absolutely wonderful parable. But let me give you just a quick cliff note version. Okay, there's three players. The first player is the sower or the farmer. Okay, the other two players are seed. Uh, the farmer casts seed. And then the third uh, player is the four soils that are represented in this parable. Now, let me quickly give you uh, 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 just a recap on these, uh, these soils. The first soil, it's the hard soil. It's compressed, it's compact. It's like the pathway around the field. The seed falls on that soil and there's immediate rejection of the seed. It's immediate. Don't have to waste any time. The second soil, seed is thrown out. The, the farmer's casting the seed. He's literally broadcasting it almost recklessly. It falls on this what's called rocky soil. Now, it's not soil that has lots of rocks in it. It's soil that has, it's a thin layer of soil with a bedrock underneath it. So the, so the seed goes into the soil, it begins to burrow down, and the roots branch out and it hits the, the, the rock bed and the, and the plant shoots up prematurely. And then the sun comes out and just burns it away because it has no root. The third soil. This is, this is the soil where the, the seed goes down and it begins to have a stalk that comes out of the ground. And it begins to show significant growth. But right about that time, the thorns and weeds come in. And it just chokes out that plant. And it dies. And it, and it just bleeds off all the nutrients and all the the things it needs to grow. And then there's a fourth soil. The seed is thrown. It lands in that soil, burrows down, and then it pops out. And it grows. And it gets a stalk. And it has other grains of wheat on it. And Matthew tells us that that soil produces 30 times, 60 times 100 times what is sown. Literally, in the original language, it's 3,000 times, 6,000 times, 10,000 times. This one soil has a massive yield. Now, you don't have to be a Bible scholar to figure this parable out. Right? You guys know where I'm going with this, right? Who's the sower? It should be us. Right? The seed the message of the kingdom, the gospel. The soils are probably represented in this room. All four soils. It's how people respond to the gospel. It's the spectrum of experiences we run into. The soils are out there, and I've got to believe in a group this size, they're in here. So, why did Jesus give this parable at this point in his ministry? I don't think it was ironic. I don't think it was arbitrary. I think it was strategic and it was well-timed. It's exactly what Kyle said. He was setting expectations for them. This is what you're going to run into. False converts, people who show growth, they have an emotional response to the gospel. You're going to have people that, are, that begin to show growth and then the 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 the, the, the the deceitfulness of wealth, the lust of other things, the cares of this world, choke it out. But it's, you're sowing for that one guy or lady because they push the kingdom forward. And I also got to believe that Jesus was saying, through story form, this is what I've been doing for the last year and a half. Sometimes a story is a little more a compelling way to tell, tell somebody how to do something, isn't it? So Jesus gives them a parable and says, hey, guys, this is what I've been doing, and I want to set your expectations because this is what you're going to be doing. Now, I'll be real quick. I know I'm taking, I'm bleeding your time. <laughs> but th this fourth soil guy or girl, whoever, we found that in fact, some cases, they're students. They're children. Bears a little bit of more biblical reflection in examination, because the Bible says a lot about this person, actually, in these parables. Let me, let me give you just quickly, and then we'll move on. The first thing we learn about this fourth soil person is, um, no, don't miss this, okay? This is big. Write this one down. They hear the message of the kingdom. They hear it. 
Now, how many times? We have no idea. But they hear it. They physically hear it. It says that they welcome the gospel. Hmm. I'm looking for people who welcome the gospel. And then it says that they understand it. Ooh, that's another key thing. And it says they have a noble and good heart. The third thing it says that this person perseveres and holds on to the gospel, doesn't let go. They stick to it. And then by persevering, they produce a crop, a 30, 60, 100 times. This is who we're looking for, among other people. So in the middle of this pattern, Jesus drops this story in to show this is exactly what I've been doing, and this is exactly what you're going to do. Pick it up, Kyle. It's all yours. So, <clears throat> Sorry, I, mean, I no, took a little longer great. than I wanted. So, uh, On the back end of that, this is where um, it gets rough. Something interesting happens. Uh, Jesus is teaching, and uh, these people come to Jesus and say, uh, this is in Luke 8, 19 through uh, 21. It's right after the parable. Right after the parable. It's the same day, actually. It says same day. Yeah. So Jesus says his parable, walks away to some area. Yeah. And, and these people say, hey, your, your mom and your brothers and your, your family, they're, they're outside. They want to see you. And Jesus points to his disciples and says, this is my family. Those who hear the word of God and do it. That's hard. That is, that's a hard statement. Um, because, you know, in Mark it says that he, the language is different. It says those who do the, the will, will of God. God. And, you know, if we look at who did the will of God perfectly, Jesus did. He did the will of God perfectly. Uh, who heard and did, <laughs> did the word? Jesus did. And so when Jesus points to his disciples and says, this is my family, those who hear the word of God and do it, um, we can say, is this us? Is this us? Are we God's family? Uh, because we hear the, the word of God and do it. And, uh, and it also is telling us that, you know, it's not, it's not about proximity. Proximity does not equal identity. Uh, identity mm -hmm. deals with hearing and doing. And I tell you, when, when you begin to hear and do the word of God, uh, it's going to divide families. I mean, it's going to divide families. It's going to begin to separate relationships uh, because, you know, I've experienced this in my own family. They look at you as a radical. They look at you as, as man, that's, he actually does what the Bible says to do, <laughs> you know. And uh, it divides families, but it also creates new families. You begin to gather uh, and do life around with obedience. People. Yeah, do life with people that uh, are on uh, on mission with Jesus to proclaim the kingdom of God. So Jesus essentially is redefining family right here. He's saying this is the family of God, and he's about to send those people out, those disciples out to start new families, uh, new families of God. And so, so right after that, in eight twenty two through thirty nine, Jesus models what a fourth soil person looks like, and that's in the story of the Gerasene demoniac. Uh, if you don't remember that story, they go on the other side of the lake. He's in he, the tombs. He's in the tombs. He's, he's cutting, cutting himself. himself. They can't bind him because he's breaking chains. And Jesus heals this man of these demons. Demons go into the pigs, run off the cliff. Town comes out. They're freaked out. They see this man sitting in his right mind, totally clothed. And they're like, get out of here, Jesus. And the man says, I want to come with you. And he says, no. And he's got like one foot in the boat, doesn't <laughs> he? And Jesus is like, uh-uh, get out. It's interesting, back. <laughs> it's interesting Jesus didn't say, yeah, come with me. I need to teach you. Because this, this guy was a, uh, he's a Gentile. Come, come learn all about the prophets and learn, you know, Hebrew and, you know, all this. And Jesus doesn't do that. Jesus says, you go and share this mercy, the mercy that I have displayed upon you to your family. And the man goes even above and beyond that. He produces 30, 60, and 100 fold fruit. He goes to the 10. ten they come, there's a crowd when Jesus comes back. When he, yeah. 10 towns. And yeah, when Jesus does it, come back, there's a number of people bringing their, their sick to Jesus. So Jesus models what this fourth, fourth soil person looks like. And all this man had was his testimony. He didn't have death, burial, and resurrection necessarily. Um, he, had, he had the understanding that Jesus was somebody awesome. And so... Uh, awesome story as they begin to see this is what four soil looks like. 
In, in Luke 9, um, well, before that, we see Jesus gathers the 12 to send them out to proclaim, heal, find persons of peace. In Luke 3 through 8, he's been doing that. That's mm-hmm. what he's been doing. And so uh, they see this. And then in Luke 9, 1 through 5. Guess what? It's time to, it's practicum, right? Yep, it's time to go, guys. And so he sends out the 12 to do exactly what Jesus had been doing. And he gives them the instructions to do that. And then in Luke 10, 1 through 12, the, the apostles, they come back and they report. And, uh, but then he sends out another group of people. 72. That's the 72 or the 70. And sends them out to do what? The exact same thing that he had just told the apostles to do. So Jesus is giving instructions to two groups of people, the same exact instructions. Which are in the parable. With, yeah, <laughs> and so, and they were exactly what Jesus had been doing. And so, you know, where did these 72 come from? You know, probably from the first wow. outing, mm-hmm. right? The first sending of the, of, the, of the 12. So we see this pattern continuing throughout Luke. And at the end of, the, at the end of Luke, Jesus is just getting these ready, these brothers ready to go. And it continues into Acts. And it continues into Acts. Right into the book of Acts. The exact same strategy is continued in Acts with the apostles. They are working this same strategy. So Jesus gives them the Great Commission. He gives them the Great Commission uh, in Luke. And it's a little bit different from the Great Commission that we see uh, in The Great Commission is in all four Gospels. Right. The one that's most 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 familiar is Matthew 28, 18 through 20. But we see the Great Commission in Luke 24, 46 through 49. He starts out by saying, the Holy Spirit is going to come upon you. I mean, you're going to receive the Holy Spirit. Well, that's interesting. That's exactly how Jesus' ministry started. And he told them to wait. wait. Yeah. Don't do anything. Don't do anything until it comes to upon To the Holy you. Spirit. And then we see in Acts 1.8, when he says, the Holy Spirit comes upon you, you will be my witnesses. So it's not a command, it's a promise. In Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth. So what Jesus had been modeling, spirit dependency, they, you know, Jesus, here it is, the spirit is upon me. He said, okay, when the spirit comes upon you, when he gave them the great commission to go and make disciples, well, what what would that transfer to them? They wouldn't have to make anything up. They wouldn't. They would know exactly what to do because they had saw, they'd seen Jesus do that, and then they had done it themselves. So making disciples to them was proclaim, heal, find persons of peace, gather people, teach them to obey Jesus, uh, just like the Great Commission says, and just like Jesus had been modeling. So, um, you know, as that pattern continues, uh, you know, through the Old Testament, uh, the New Testament into into Acts, um, and it transfers to us today, because the Great Commission is accomplished, you know, via the work of the Holy Spirit, working through disciples. And uh, as we begin to follow the pattern that Jesus has set out for us, the Holy Spirit begins to work through that, and uh, we begin to see an amazing thing happen. It, we start to see the scriptures come alive because and the you see wisdom, the scriptures differently, though, when you're living that pattern. The wisdom, the the, the secrets of the kingdom are be, being revealed now that we're doing what the Bible says. When you do the things you see in the Bible, you see the things you see in the Bible. And you begin to love Jesus like never before. Yeah. It's awesome. What he said there, the secrets of the kingdom are given to you. Actually, those are Jesus' words. He says that at the end of the parable, uh, right in the middle of the parable of the sower, he goes, the secrets of the kingdom have been given to you. So this begs the question, okay? We gotta, I'm going to tie this up here in just a little bit. 2,000 years later, Collin County, half a world away, how does that pattern translate to us today? Are we exempt? Would 900,000, give or take, people who do not name the name of Christ within our, our, our county? Um, if you could show that slide, the next slide up. Um, here we go. I think you're going to recognize this. <laughs> I think what we do is, number one, spirit dependency. I think the second thing we do is find God-prepared people who open up their sphere of influence. This is not 
a making strategy. This is a finding strategy. I'm not creating nothing. I'm just joining God where he's at work. Number three, proclaiming the kingdom of God. So when I find these people, what do I do with them? Hey, yeah, you're a great guy. No, I proclaim the kingdom of God, the gospel, and demonstrating the power of the kingdom to heal marriages, to heal parenting, to heal your finances, and in some cases, heal your body. And then we begin to gather people, raising up leaders to continue the work and then moving on to unreached people and places. This is a pattern that just chases its tail. You never get to the bottom of this pattern. You never go, hey, there's a seven. <laughs> it just starts over and over again. And I don't know if you guys realize it, we're all beneficiaries of this pattern. You wouldn't be sitting here if you, this pattern had not been worked by somebody. We owe it to pay it forward. So Kyle, um, you work with a lot of churches and you travel around and, and, and stuff. I, tell me, what are some of the barriers to these sick things that you see that are, are just, they just block this stuff from happening? Mm -hmm. So if you don't mind just sharing a few things. Uh, yeah, I mean, some of the barriers, uh, I think one of the main, one of the main barriers that, that we run into is that there's, a, there's a phrase or some language that, that we continue to hear uh, all the time, and that is, you have to earn the right to share the gospel. And uh, I'm just going to say right now, that's not true. <laughs> uh, that's not biblical. Um, you know, earning the right to share the gospel was accomplished by Jesus when he died on the cross and rose from the dead. <coughs> and uh, I, I earned the right to Jesus when I surrendered to him. And uh, he gave me the Great Commission day one uh, when I became a, a believer. And so <clears throat> if, if they mean by that that I have to earn the right to share the gospel, that my life should reflect a relationship with Jesus, maybe so. But to say that my life adds anything or my relationship adds any power to the gospel, uh, that's just not true. And so... Uh, we don't need to earn the right to share the gospel. The, the right's already been earned. That helps to live a good life. Yeah. It doesn't it, hurt. It does. Yeah. I know. It does. <laughs> and that, that is, it's but, you know, good to be nice to people. Yeah. Right? But anytime Jesus encountered strangers or Paul encountered strangers, he was up front with the kingdom. You know, it's interesting he mentioned this. Okay, this, 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 was, this is 48 hours old. I was sharing the gospel with a lady just the other day, and I get to the gospel, and she goes, oh, I know this. And she, I go, I start talking about how she, you know, you could, you're a believer. And she goes, there's no way I could ever share this. I said, well, why is that? She goes, the life I've lived. She goes, if you knew my life, there's no one would want to hear this message from me. And I immediately turned to the woman at the well who had five husbands. Mm -hmm. And she immediately told, she, she, she had that message. She didn't earn the right mm -hmm. to share that. Mm -hmm. um, so anyway. Or the garrison of money. The garrison of money. The guy yeah, was yeah. an absolute freak and God sent him. To yeah. to in that fact, that's even more powerful, I think, sometimes. <laughs> I know it. What are some other things you run into? Uh, the, the second thing I think that, uh, that we run into is that, you know, people want to make disciples. People want to obey the Great Commission, um, but they just haven't been trained. They, they don't know how to do it. And so just helping people answer simple questions, who do I share with? Uh, what do I say and what do I do when they say yes? And, uh, or no. Or no. <laughs> or yeah. no. That happens, yeah. <laughs> or that happens a lot. Or maybe. Uh, but, uh, you know, there's just, um, you know, when we look at the Great Commission, it's not just sharing the gospel. The Great Commission includes discipleship. Teach them to obey all that I've commanded. So, you know, let's not confuse, you know, ah, I just don't want to share the gospel or I just don't know how. You know, uh, well, let me teach you how to share the gospel. Let me teach you also how to make disciples to teach them right. to obey Jesus. So I think the second reason is there's just, a, there's just been a lack of a, equipping, and that's just one thing that's awesome about First Baptist Church Allen is that there is so many great opportunities here to learn how to engage in the Great Commission, engage in this pattern. So there's, uh, there's no more guilt. There's no more paralysis. It's, hey, let's get into the game. Here's some simple tools, and let's begin to follow Jesus' pattern. Right. So that's, a, that's another barrier. The, the third barrier is there's just a misunderstood um, 
Uh, it's just misunderstanding of who should be doing the ministry. Uh, a lot of times we think that, you know, the paid people, the staff, you know, we're just going to bring everyone to them, and, you know, that's what they're paid to do, so we're just going to give all the ministry to them. That's their job. Well, that's, that's not what it says in Ephesians 4, 11, and 12. Uh, Ephesians 4, 11, and 12 says that the leadership is equipped to equip the saints to do the work of the ministry. So the guys like Ross and, and Chad and uh, everyone here, their, act, their role is to actually equip us to do the Great Commission. And so the job of ministry, the, the joy of ministry is ours. We get to do this uh, as a part of Jesus' family. And so I think there's just been a misunderstanding of who actually is qualified, who actually can do ministry. And if, if you have the Holy Spirit and you, you've been saved, you've been qualified. And so it's our job, it's, it's the church's job, the leadership's job, to give you the tools, to give you the permission, to give you the authority. Um, and that's kind of the other end of it. You know, in some instances, there just hasn't been the authority or the permission given by the staff. It's like fertilizer. Right. It just, when you give the authority away, that we've seen. And so that's one thing, great thing that you guys have done is just give it away. Permission, go. Authority, you can do it. This is yours. And so that's just been an amazing thing and a barrier that you all have uh, overcome greatly. So That's good. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to wind this up. We're going to watch a video, all right? Let me set the video up. Uh, how many of you know who Michael Phelps is, right? All right, good. He, so, <laughs> on. He's one of the most uh, decorated Olympic athletes in the history of Olympics. Uh, in fact, in 2008, he won eight gold medals. What many people might not remember in 2008, he was not supposed to win eight gold medals. He was supposed to win seven and supposed to get silver or bronze in, the, in another one. However, he got a gold. <clears throat> he was part of one of the most incredible relay races in the history of the Olympics in 2008. The French were the overwhelming favorites to win this race, this relay race. In fact, they were talking trash right before it. <laughs> and so if you could roll the video, and then I'll, I'm going to connect the dots here in just a moment. If you guys can roll that. Jason Lezak is going to have to make up some ground on Elaine Bernard, who stands six feet five and can absolutely fly. I just don't think they can do it, Dan. I mean, Jason Lezak has been there how many times in his career has he anchored this free relay and medley relay, but I, I just don't think he can do it. He's trying to ride that wave as much as possible. Bernard is pulling away from him. Lezak, the world record a three-time Olympian. The world record is absolutely going to be shattered here. The United States try to hang on to second. They should get the silver medal. Australia is in bronze territory right now, but Lezak is closing a little bit on Bernard. Can the veteran chase him down and pull off a shocker here? Well, there's no doubt that he's tightening up. Bernard is losing to ground. Here comes Lezak. Unbelievable at the end. He's done. Six split for Lezak. What a clutch, fast swim when they needed it. Who's talking now? <laughs> Stunned. I think they need to use another word other than smash. Wow. That might be the most incredible relay split I've ever seen in my entire life. I uh, went a little long in the video just to see the French's face there, so <laughs> it's not, I was supposed to cut it off early. Uh, I'm going to tie it back to that video in just a second. Can you throw the last verse up there, Matthew 24, 14? Jesus said some remarkable words at the end of his ministry. Um, in Matthew 24, 14, he said, And this gospel <clears throat> of the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. 
You know, we have been involved in a race that started 2,000 years ago. That race has been heading toward this verse. Some notable people have gone before us. Some of them you might know. The Apostle Paul, Lottie Moon, Billy Graham, Hudson Taylor. But the truth is that this race toward this verse has been run by a nameless, faceless army of believers that we'll never know until the other side of eternity. How many of you know Jason Lezak? No, you've never heard his name before you came in here, but you know who Michael Phelps is, right? I often wonder if this generation we're in right now is going to touch the wall on this verse. Jesus says, when this gospel is going, I'm going I'm to come. I don't know if you guys noticed in the prayer time, I read Hebrews chapter 13, right? There's a great cloud of witnesses that have gone before us that are cheering us on. Did you hear it when Jason was getting close to the wall, the crescendo? I mean, it was like, come on, it's going to happen. Oh, my goodness. I mean, you could hear the people screaming. And it says in Hebrews that they are cheering us on. They're saying, throw off everything that's hindering you. Get rid of it. Get rid of it. It's worth the race to run in this race. I wonder if there's people in this room who are going to touch the wall on that one. They're going to see Jesus come back. The unfortunate reality, and this is my experience, is that most, many believers don't even know there's a race going on. They think the pool's Hawaiian Falls, and there's a race going on at the other end. So, just based upon the preponderance of Scripture, I've got to believe when we stand before Christ one day, and we all are going to, he's going to ask us what we did with this verse. Were you part of the race? And I want to hope that all of us, including myself, he'll be able to look at us and go, well done. You were in the race. You did something. You got the gospel out. I want to end with this. Uh, If you could turn to your bolts and and then I'll be done. Down at the bottom, we're going to do something that is a little unorthodox here. Um, And if you don't feel comfortable doing it right now, I, I hope you do it. I will. I will. What will you do with this message? Ultimately, it's between you and God, okay? I don't know. But we have to ask this question every time we hear the word of God, because if we don't ask, what am I supposed to do with this? I'll tell you what's going to end up turning you into. It's going to turn you into a knowledge freak. The thinking, coming to church is sitting in a pew and sitting in a BFG where you just hear someone tell you a bunch of neat stuff and you walk away with some more Bible knowledge. No, God wants you to be obedient to what you hear. Maturity is defined by obedience, not knowledge. So what are you going to do with this? So I want you to put something in there. Now I realize you're sitting next to people like, whoa, i got to write something in front of them. Okay, do it at some other time. I don't want to write maybe something now. If you don't know what to put in there, to help you get into this pattern that we've talked about. Let me just give you three simple things that maybe you can. I'll maybe suggest these things, and you might know where I'm going with this. Come to a training. What do you got to lose? You have to lose a Saturday. Can you give one Saturday out of your life to come begin to get equipped to get into this race? The next trainings on the 24th. We have several trainings during the course of the year. I ain't giving you a Saturday, Ross. Okay. Will you give me an hour and a half? On Sunday night at 4.30 over in E103? Or on Wednesday evening at 6 p.m.? Just come over there. You don't have to do anything. Just watch. And you'll, you'll get to be, see some of this pattern happening right in front of you. You're like, no, 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 I'm not going to give you an hour and a half on, on Wednesday or Sunday evening. All right. Be willing to go to a group on Sunday morning that is living this pattern 
and he's keeping it going. We have three to four groups that are doing this stuff that are constantly churning this pattern into you. So those are three things you could possibly do. I don't know, it's between you and God. But you always got to ask yourself, what am I supposed to do with what I just heard? And then lastly, now, put your seatbelt on for this one. You need to have someone that's going to hold you accountable to what you put down. Mm. <laughs> Listen, in our battle for obedience, in our battle against sin, we need all the help we can get. Everything is swimming in the other direction. Your flesh, the world, Satan, and your battle for obedience, you need help. I need help. You can't do it on your own. You have to have people that hold you accountable that go, hey, did you do that? Do you realize we have accountability everywhere in our life? Our work, our marriage, anywhere that matters, there's accountability. Why not here? I know this is uncomfortable. I don't like it. I will. And who's going to hold me accountable to it? You know, Hebrews 10, 24 says, spur one another on toward love and good works. That's what we're to do. It's to spur one another on. Let's give people the permission to do that.